The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really looked forward to. I honestly don't think there's a person on the planet Earth that I see more eye to eye with than this gentleman. That is for sure. His name is Simon Black. He is with SovereignMan.com. Simon, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show, my friend. I've been waiting a long time to talk to you. Well, that was quite an intro. Thanks very much. So I started getting into this space with macro and just personal freedom and liberty back when I retired in 2012. And one of the first places I went was your blog. And I've been reading that consistently. I, I get your emails. And uh, pretty much my whole family does, by the way. But for the, my viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with your backstory, can you kind of get us up to speed? My backstory? Sure. Uh, I mean, ultimately, uh, I'm, I'm a capitalist. Uh, I, I'm an investor, an entrepreneur. I you know, uh, started businesses, been involved in a lot of startups, a lot of acquisitions. My background um, feels like in my former life, and this goes back 20 years now, I was in the military, I was an intelligence officer. And that was for me when I started first having my, my big awake. Uh, we right. were in the desert, it was the Middle East, it was right before the, the, the Gulf War, uh, when you know, the invasion of Iraq, and they kept running around about weapons of mass destruction, and George W. Bush was going on TV saying, we know he's got these weapons, and you know we're all, uh, we're all looking at each other going, what is this guy talking about? And so it felt like there was a, a, there was a lot of deceit. There was a lot of, uh, you know, th there's a lot of things that didn't really add up. And I had this happy-go-lucky, you know, we're forced for good kind of thing. And I realized all of a sudden, it was this very dark moment for me when I realized that a lot of stuff I'd been brought up to believe yeah. was actually not true. And, and, and it kind of set me down this path of independence really just kind of being independent from the system thinking independently acting independently uh and you know and that led to a, a lot of ways that the things that i do in my life now are really all about just really kind of freedom and independence and and uh and i think the way that i've set myself up in, in my businesses and so forth and that's really what sovereign man is all about yeah and you've got several businesses i believe in chile and then you're part of act uh 2022 and 60 with uh, with Schiff and Maloney and a bunch of other guys in Puerto Rico. There's a lot of guys here, yeah. So so one of the companies I founded was a was a, a large agriculture business based in South America. Um, here in in Puerto Rico, where I live, um, you know, I own a bank, uh, among other things, and that's actually a separate deal. It's not it's not uh, 20 or 22 or any of those, uh, which they changed. But yeah, there's a lot of guys that are living here because Puerto Rico for Really, for anybody in the world, and especially U.S. citizens, it's the best deal um, for sure uh, with respect to taxes. So uh, I know you guys have, have talked about this, but yeah, there's a lot of guys living down here because as an investor, you can pay nothing on, on capital gains if you're in the market or cryptocurrency or these sorts of things. Uh, you pay nothing on capital gains. And if you have a business, then your, your business, your corporate tax rate is 4%. Yeah. Um, my, my bank also has preferential tax treatment based in Puerto Rico and, and conforms to, you know, uh, parts of the incentives code. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it really is. And there's a lot of people that have moved down here. People, you'd be surprised, actually, at how, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, my business might not qualify. You'd be surprised at how many people actually do qualify because every business has things. I mean, even if you have a very kind of bricks and mortar type business, every business has something that they can pick up and move to another jurisdiction. And if that jurisdiction is Puerto Rico, then you can really, I mean, you could save yourself an enormous amount of money, um, you know, from the, from the, uh, from the tax savings. I mean, taxes is one of the most, the costliest thing for most people that they'll ever have to pay in their entire life. Right. Uh, and, and being able to slash that in a way that is completely legitimate from 30, 40, 50% down to literally zero. There's just no deal that you'll ever, there's no investment that you'll make. There's no business that you can start where you can have that kind of return and, and literally no risk. Because, you know, so long as you follow the law, as long as you're not breaking the law, no, it's, just, I mean, it's not a hard thing to do. You gotta come down and spend time on the beach. That's literally, you know, that's what the law says. So right. as long as you do that, there's risk. There's no risk. 
and they will never find an investment and you will never find any kind of business or anything that could produce you know that kind of return for you relative to the risk so it's it's, it's a great deal it's not going to last forever um you know if, if you, you know the, the risk is that you're going to miss it basically yeah. that's the that's that's the problem yeah i went down there for that in 2013 or so i was yeah. at uh I was, I think I, I was talking to Ship the other day. He said you might be out at Bahia Beach. I was a member out there. There's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. But, um, you know, I've listened to several of your podcast episodes and I know you're really a student of history, mm -hmm. which is just fantastic. I remember you used to start every single episode by saying, well, let's go back in time and just tell a yeah. story from, you know, two or 300 years ago that would be applicable to what we're seeing today. I mean, and, and you know a lot more about history than I do. If, if you were to look at what we experienced in the United States in 2020 or what we're experiencing now, is there any precedence for that in, in, to your knowledge throughout history or is this just a of course. new game? Of course, uh, of course, of course, of um, course. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, not everything is... Uh, you know, every, everything is just a repeat of stuff that's already happened before. Right. There's no, you know, there's no original idea. There's no, uh, I mean, there, I mean, everything is, is just really, uh, you know, a little bit of a remix in a way. We take our, our new stuff and we mix it with the old stuff. But I mean, these, these sorts of, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, everything, wars, revolts, revolutions, social conflicts, you know, cultural wars, all these things that they just happen so many times. And one of the things that you heard a lot, especially last summer, is people said, oh, it's 1968 all over again. And I would say, actually, it's closer to 1568. Um, mm. And, and the, the one that I always felt was, was kind of more a more appropriate um, comparison to sort of what was happening was the, the Dutch Revolt um, that, that, that took place in the 1500s. And it lasted an incredibly long time. And this is what I always kind of tell people. This was an 80-year conflict. Now, the world moved a lot slower. Than it does today. We planes and internet and you know Twitter and all this kind of stuff now that they didn't have back then. So this is 80 years of conflict, and and it was a it was a revolt really between uh, Catholics and Protestants, and and it was all the same sorts of things. People going down and ripping down statues and monuments, and people out in the streets setting things on fire. Private businesses and people's homes that had nothing to do with any of the conflict weren't even on one side or the other. Uh, you know, people are just getting ensnared into this. There was all sorts of political folly. Debts and deficits were going through the roof. You know, the economic consequences of all these things. And, and you know, along the way, they had a couple of plagues over the 80-year period. You know, and so, so you sort of look at this and you go, "We've been here before." And uh, the the thing that like people ask me a lot, and they go, you know, they say uh, two questions. I always think are cute. Is they you know people say like what do you think is the best objective source of information you know and I always say like who said there was an objective source of information I mean they're like everybody has a bias everybody's got some way they feel the only difference is like some people are more honest about it right. uh, you can't watch the media and expect guys are 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 you know really being objective about anything because they have opinions too they just pretend that they're you know transparent and objective but the other one is is related especially to COVID and people say well, what do you think this is going to go back to normal. I thought, who, you know, whoever promised anything that about normal, you know, whoever said that, except, you know, that politicians that say that, right? Politicians that promise return to normalcy, which is also something that we've seen before. Um, there was a lot of guys, there were a lot of people saying that after World War One. After World War One, not only did they have major world war, um, you know, they started moving off the gold standard. We had the Federal Reserve, uh, was still very new. We had, uh, you know, economic problems, problems with the currency, uh, market panics. And the Spanish flu, yeah. and so and people were just they were just sick of it. They were so sick of it, and they said, and so the politicians promising a return to normalcy, uh, you know, in the late uh, you know the late nineteen teens and early nineteen twenties, um, that was the thing that everybody wanted to hear, and the thing that everybody wants to hear today. But it never goes back to normal, and that's not really a, that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, you know, normal, normal return to normal and staying normal in a way means that there's actually never progress. And sometimes, you know, progress is, it is true. Progress is messy. And sometimes, you know, there, there are, uh, 
um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's some, some really messy things that happen in the course of that. And I think COVID was actually very interesting in that respect because I always try and look at the bright side of things. I think COVID did a lot of horrible, horrible, horrible things. We look at government overreach and the trillions upon trillions of dollars that was spent, the massive debt levels, the, uh, you know, all the money printing. Uh, and we can talk about that later if you want. But, you know, I think there are a lot of good things. And I think one of the greatest things about COVID, one of the big bits is that for the first time, a lot of people realized, hey, wait a minute, I don't have to be chained to my geography anymore. You know, I don't have to be in this town. I don't even, I don't have to be in this state. I don't even have to be in this country. I could move and go somewhere else. I could go to Puerto Rico and take those tax benefits. I could move overseas. I could move off to the countryside. I could move to the near near my, my, my girlfriend or my boyfriend, whatever it is I've always wanted to do. I can do that stuff now because more and more people now realize that they are actually independent of location. I think that's a very powerful trend because for the longest time, it was one of the last in a way, almost vestiges of the feudal system in a way that people were sort of tethered to the land uh, because they had to be near the office, right? It right. was sort of a modern day feudal system. It's like, oh, you know, the you know, the office in New York City, so I got to be in this, you know, 50 or 100 mile radius or something like that so I can get to work, take the train, have, you know, three hour commutes every day, all that sort of stuff. It is almost, it is almost feudal. When you think about it, it's like being medieval peasant, and you, you know, it's like you can't really leave. Um, you know, people have the ability to sort of maybe pick up a move and get another job, but they're in the same situation. But now all of a sudden people are like, hey, I can do this from anywhere. I can be in my house. I can be on the beach. I can be wherever. And that, I think, is an incredibly powerful trend for human liberty. And do you think people realize that they shouldn't be tied to one country specifically? And maybe it made them realize that having a plan B and maybe a second passport is really a good idea. I think some people are starting to start to get, I mean, it, it's, it's baby steps, right? So I think some people they start realizing, well, I don't have to be here, you know, and, and that we can see in the data. We can see that in the data of, you know, we can see that in a lot of actually uh, data sets, including, you know, real estate prices in New York City, San Francisco, et cetera, and just, and just seeing the number of, number of homes on the market. We can see, you know, the, the trends and, you know, among literally moving companies and moving vans. Right. Um, and all these sorts of things. So you can see the trends of like so many people that are leaving and the influx of places like Texas and Florida. I've seen it here out my window, um, which you can't see. It's a gorgeous view. Take my word for it. Uh, there's all day, every day, there's sales tours running all over the place. I mean, this place was, I mean, it was very sleepy, very quiet mm. up until probably the summertime. And that was when a lot of people said, okay, I'm out, you know, it, 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 you know, that you're starting to see the images, you know, cities on fire and people can feel however they want to feel about that whole movement. But, you know, let's at least acknowledge however somebody might feel about the sort of ideology and politics of it, that for a lot of people, you know, might see literally flames out their window. That might be very uncomfortable, especially if you've got kids and family and so forth and say, you know what, I just, I, I just want to get out of here. Um, that in, in addition to that, obviously being locked down and so forth, people said, I want to be on a place where I can run around, I can be on the beach. And there was a massive influx of mm -hmm. people coming into Puerto Rico. So in a lot, a lot of these people from, uh, even, you know, California and so forth ended up here. So my, just, you know, that's, that's just a personal anecdote. It's not really a data set, but from what I can tell, um, the data is actually in the real estate prices here. There's pockets of this in Puerto Rico uh, that a lot of prices in some respects are up 50 to even 100 um, percent, yeah. literally since last year. It's been it's been insane. And so if people are kind of realized, well, I can leave town, I can leave the state, I can leave the, you know, the continental U.S. and head to a territory where I get a lot of tax benefits. And I think there's some people that are also starting to realize uh, I can also sort of leave the country entirely. Our data set internally, one of the things that, that uh, we help um, our customers with is, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of different options for people who are interested in passports. And, you know, we've gone and actually met with heads of state and, and you know, the government bodies in a lot of these countries that offer citizenship to work out a lot of the details and things like that. And, and there have been, um, you know, from what they're telling us, uh, we get a lot of that data directly from them. There's been, a, again, a spike 
in people going and applying for things like economic citizenship programs, where you can make an investment or a donation in some capacity and get uh, citizenship in return. And you know what we're getting from the government sources there is a substantial increase in applications and issuances of economic citizenship. So I think to your point, yeah, there are definitely a lot of people who are starting to realize, like, I need to, you know, I'm, I, if I'm not ready to get out now, I at least need to be ready. I need to be thinking about it. And that's one of the things we always said is that, you know, if you ever feel like you need to leave, you don't want to start having that conversation. You don't want to start that planning process while you're packing your bags, Mm -hmm. you know, because if you're doing that, then you're emotional, you're scared, you know, and, and and as human beings, we tend to make very poor decisions when we're emotional, especially when we're scared. So the right thing to do is to think about your circumstances. And everything that you want to achieve, the life that you want to have, the lifestyle you want to have, the things that are important to you and what you prioritize in your life, and think about those sorts of things now while you're rational before the proverbial hits the fan. And, you know, that way you'll actually have a much more solid foundation in terms of being able to analyze what the options are and what's good for you and what's not good for you and be able to sort of find all that stuff way in advance. It's just a sensible thing to do. Yeah, I totally agree. I was actually in St. Bart's for three months. I went from Medellin. Uh, I got locked down there. And then yeah. I made it to St. Bart's because I got some buddies there. They said it was wide open. This was a, a few months ago. And I was there for two or three months. And people from California, you know, Democrats, Republicans, doesn't matter. All right. They were all there for the same reason, just to get to some place where they had some sense of normalcy and some sense of freedom. But I know a lot of people watching this right now are saying to themselves, okay, that may be great for Simon and George. Maybe they have the resources to do that. I don't. I'm stuck in um, you know, Phoenix. I'm stuck in XYZ city in the United States. So if I had to say, listen, if, you, if, if I put you in a city and say, listen, you can't leave. You've yeah. got to stay here. You've got to stay within the United States. How would you set up a plan B for yourself? Yeah, you know, there's, I'm always sort of first to say there's no one size fits all solution because everybody's in a totally different situation. I mean, somebody that's got, you know, a, a, you know, a single parent with six kids versus, right. you know, uh, one, you know, somebody that, you know, an elderly couple that's retired uh, versus somebody that's 17, you know, graduated a year early from high school because they're, a, you know, academic hotshot and, you know, have sort of the whole world in front of them. All the people are in completely different categories um you know the, the the other thing about it too is is everybody has a different kind of risk tolerance some people uh for me for example um i am i'm a I'm kind of person who i am always extremely comfortable with uncertainty right. because i have a lot of confidence in myself yep. and i always and I, I have the confidence to know that regardless of what happens I, i'm going to be able to figure out a solution to be okay so I don't necessarily need to know exactly that what's going to happen you know, every step along the way. Some people are much less comfortable with uncertainty. And frankly, that's quite common in, in human nature to not be terribly comfortable with uncertainty. As human beings, we have a fear of the unknown. And this is why a lot of times people stay in jobs they don't like. They work for bosses that they hate. They stay in relationships with people that don't really love them or care about them. Sometimes they stay in abusive relationships because in a lot of respects, you get accustomed to things that are negative influences in your life. You get accustomed to things right. that aren't really good for you. And, and because we're afraid of the unknown, you know, we'd rather take something that we're used to that's bad than deal with something that could be good. But who knows, you know, what's going to be. And that's human nature. And I would actually say for the people that go, I can't leave, I can't this and I can't that, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins, but I mean, that might be the first thing to consider is just kind of a little bit of a mental check and just say, but really, is can't is a can't is an absolute word. It's really it's an absolute term, and there's not a whole lot of absolutes in our world. I mean, let's be honest. There are things that have happened that we would have used absolutes even up until January, February of last year, and go, that's never going to happen. Right. That right. can't happen. It's you know it won't happen. We used absolute terminology. Up until, you know, mid-March, and then all of a sudden people went, oh, my God. Right. And, and, and the thing that I kept saying over and over and over again is that everything about this, you have to approach from a position of, of ignorance and uncertainty and, and realize that absolutely everything is on the table. So as soon as somebody says, I can't do this and I can't do that, I would really kind of push back at least a little bit and say, but really, 
think about that a little bit and say, you really, you know, you can because what you might find is if you get past can't, you might think, well, you know, what's what's the what's the limitation? Right. And then how can I overcome that limitation? It's not that I can't, it's comfort zone. People right, exactly. The comfort zone. Right, exactly. And so a lot of times, you know, I, I think that's the case with a, with a lot of things. And and you know, I don't I don't ever try and you know, I don't ever try and talk to people or anything, but I'll give you an example of like cryptocurrency. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, you're, you're just mentioning Peter. Like Peter, Peter and I have known each other for years, um, and uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And I, you know, he's he's like the, you know, he he's always like railing against cryptocurrency. <laughs> I just got a text from a buddy of mine this morning who was, who was he goes, why is what, what's up with Peter? Why is he always why does he always have to jump all over you know Bitcoin? I'm like I don't know. Like I I was just I was texting with Peter at like six o'clock in the morning about like. Some other stuff, and I just have to feel like, like, man, this guy just gets up in the morning and it's like wants to dump all over crypto. I don't, I don't really get it. But the point is, is that some people feel very strongly one way or the other. Uh, I think there are a lot of incredible things about crypto. I try to not get religious about anything, but I right. think if you look at it at face value, there are a lot of incredibly positive things about crypto. The issue that I always have is when people go, "Oh, it's a scam. Bitcoin's a scam," and I go, "Really, a scam? Like, why is it a scam?" You know, people go, oh, "I just don't get it." And I go, "Well." If you don't understand something, that doesn't make it a scam. Right. It just means maybe you should educate yourself. And I think that goes for anything. If you're afraid of something, you're afraid of the unknown, you know, you, you think something's negative because you're not familiar with it. Well, that's not a reason to say I can't do something because you don't know what it really is. That's just an opportunity to educate yourself. That's your instincts telling you, I don't know enough about this thing to render an objective decision. So my instincts, my human nature, is to sort of be afraid, is to be skeptical, is to be, you know, skepticism is great, but our instincts cause us to speak in absence and go, I'll never do that, or that's, a, you know, that, that will never work, or I can't do this. You know, whenever you find these absolutes coming out of your mouth, that's when you really want to start checking your logic and wondering, like, what, why do I feel this way? What is it? Is it something I can overcome with better information, with better education? Uh, you know, with a little bit more will to take action, can I manage some things in my personal life a little bit better? And I think a lot of people can actually overcome that uh, concept of can't. Um, yeah. And again, not to not to get all Tony Robbins on you, but I do think that's that's something that a lot of people might want to want to consider. Yeah. So if you were that American, let's say you got a wife, you got two kids in private school, you're a member of the country club, the wife yeah. might be on board with probably not. <laughs> arm twisting there. I mean, I've just told people, listen, at the, at the very least, get an RV for heaven's sakes, park it in your driveway, get a good diesel truck, because you can always, you know, bug out to Mexico or go to the mountains if it hits the fan, and then you can work on maybe an international plan B from there. But but if you were personally in that position, how would you tackle the problem? And the problem being maybe potential uh, social unrest or just being in an environment where you just don't want to spend time. Yeah. Um... Well, it's funny you mentioned, you know, the kind of the bug out, um, you know, my, my sister just moved to northern Idaho uh, not too long ago. And it was great because I, I went to go visit her. I went on vacation a couple of months back uh, and we were we were just kind of tooling around the U.S. We were driving across. I, I said, I, I said, I really want to go to uh, Mount Rushmore before they cancel it. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to be able to see that I'd never been before. So we we're driving. We drove all across Montana. We went to go see my sister in northern Idaho and she's so far up north. That when I finally pulled up to her driveway, I got a text message on my phone that said, "Welcome to Canada." Wow! I thought, I, I thought that's awesome. And then <laughs> I was talking to her, and I'm like, "You know how close to Canada you are?" She goes, "Oh yeah." She lives like nestled like in this like hillside. She goes, "It's literally just over the hills." And huh. I'm like, "That's genius! Yeah. That's genius!" You know, because <laughs> literally it's like you just you just walk over the hills and you're in Canada. You know, it's just perfect. So look, every you know everybody's got. They're, you know, unique situations like, you know, you live in Topeka, Kansas, you can't do that. Um, you know, you live in Brownsville, Texas, you can. Uh, but it's not really about that. The, the thing that I always sort of encourage people to start with is, is you've got to determine for yourself and, you know, based on your circumstance, your family, so forth. Like, what are your priorities? Right. right? What are the things that are most important to you? Because for some people, you know, for, for me, it's, um, you know, I, my priority is going to be different than other people's priorities. But one of the things that's important to me, for example, is uh, so like we actually had an event uh, for our 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 uh, 
total access members we call it. It's like our, our highest level group inside of Sovereign. We had an event in Mexico. I guess it was last last weekend or just this weekend before this this past weekend. And um, what a different world, you know, out there just in, in, in the fact that it's just so much more calm and relaxed and, you know, nobody's going to come up and pepper spray you because you, you, you know, you want to get a breath, a breath of fresh air on the beach, you know, all this, this sort of stuff. I mean, uh, you know, no, nobody's flying out of, out of nowhere to body tackle children, you know, because they're not wearing a mask. I mean, it, it, it's, it's this sort of thing. I mean, we, I did a, I actually did an interview with a guy in Australia who used to be uh, in the government. He was, um, you know, fairly high up in the Treasury Department in the state of Victoria in Australia, and he was talking about he resigned his post after seeing all these stories about police. They were literally putting kids in the hospital. They were beating the, they were beating kids because they weren't wearing a mask, and they beat them so severely the kids were in the ICU, mm -hmm. and that was perfectly fine because they were in the ICU for other reasons other than COVID. They were being savagely beaten by the police. You know, and then this and this guy is, you know, he's so disgusted by that. He, you know, he he quit his job and he resigned from his position. And it's just the sort of thing like to me, like that's the kind of environment for me that I like to be in. I like to be in the kind of environment where I can just be, you know, I I just like to be, uh, I like to be free. Uh, I don't I don't like to, you know, I, I don't I don't like police states. I don't like surveillance states. I don't like these sorts of things. So I I like to be in a more free place. So that's to me, it's, it, that's the kind of priority. And I think everybody's got to sort of consider the things that are. Most important to them is it keeping the kids in school, or you know, do you even really care? Are you, are you fine with homeschooling? Are you fine with remote learning? You know, it, it, it's really what it is. Like, and I, I'm I'm not trying to, you know, be a. I, I I understand like what you're asking me. It's like, but there's not like this. Like, do this, 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 and this because it would be a, uh, it would be a, a, an intellectually disingenuous for me to, to even try and say. Because it's really up to everybody individually, but the things that are most important to them, the things they want to accomplish for their family. It's also things like, you know, are are your, you know, the things that you do, not what you're doing now, but what you envision yourself doing. You know, how do you think you might want to spend your time? And do you have, you know, skills that are, you know, maybe not what you're doing right now. Maybe you're a factory worker, and that's not exactly something that you can, you know, take with you if you if you move. But are there other skills that you have? That you could start, you know, doing something else that's, that's different. That you can start generating income to support your family and so forth. And if not, maybe that ought to be the priority. You know, maybe you ought to spend six months, you know, spending, you know, as much of your free time as possible. You know, get up an hour earlier every morning and literally study, you know, different things about how you can, you know, generate independent income. You know, in a, in a way that you might be able to support and feed your family. That's been one of the other big trends from from COVID. I mean, so many people, so many people, especially people that have, you know, dull online based things have. It's it's weird to say, but they were killing it in 2020. I mean, all this stuff. I mean, like anybody that's on social media, whatever, has probably seen the bazillion ads. I mean, people that have like workout from home stuff. I mean, it's just so many people. I mean, I know so many of these guys uh, and girls that were just king it in 2020 and that's the thing is that you know every one of these great events it creates opportunity all these things always create opportunities and you know if you can position yourself to get in front of those opportunities you can do very well and if you have the right kinds of skills to be able to deal with that so you know being able to to generate some income for yourself doing things online whatever it might not be for everybody but the point is that opportunity is fast and growing uh, you know, I mean, there's people, I mean, people every day, there's more people going and making money, whatever, opening up stores and Amazon, getting into e-commerce, you know, doing things online, whatever. I mean, there's so many of those types of opportunities. And so somebody that might realize like, hey, I might be able to do something too, but I don't have the skills. Well, you know, if you really want to pick up and move, but you feel stuck because you're tethered to your job, that might be an opportunity for you to say, well, what, what are the skills that I can build right now? That, that will give me the opportunity to exit and have a little bit more freedom in my life. Yeah, right. So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Everybody's got different circumstances. Um, so there's, there's really not a one size fits all solution. I will say one thing um, you mentioned earlier to say, well, what if I'm you know, married and my husband or wife's not on board? We run into this a lot. Yeah. We run into this a lot where uh, most of the time the spouses are sort of on the same page because they kind of look out the window and they get it. Uh, a lot of times, one spouse in particular has a normalcy bias. They just assume that everything's going to go back to normal because that's the way it's always been. 
and you know, to me, I kind of see that and say, well, you're just not paying attention if you think that everything's just going to go back to normal. You're being, frankly, a little bit naive uh, if you can stomach everything that's happened over the last year and go, it's all going to be fine. Um, you know, because some politician said something or some guy, in, you know, on the TV said something and you think everything's going to be okay. I think the best way to deal with that is, you know, most importantly, to just have, uh, you know, a very rational discussion where the thing that you get buy in is in the priorities where you have to really sit down with your spouse and just sort of acknowledge, like, what are the things that are most important to us? It's the kids. It's the, you know, these sorts of things is making sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's safety, it's all this sort of stuff. And so even if you say, well, the spouse, you know, my spouse doesn't want to leave because whatever, uh, you know, there's an elderly parent, that, you know, that, that that requires care and, you know, they're kind of entrenched and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, whatever, they got the country club membership or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, that's where, yeah, sure. At least having the option, the optionality makes sense because a lot of people have, you know, I call it sort of the aha moment. The aha moment is when you start to realize, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was supposed to be. There's something else going on here. This is just weird. A lot of people had that aha moment way back in, you know, uh, you know, the beginning of the pandemic. Mine, you know, was again, when I was in the military, my aha moment was when Colin Powell went in front of the United Nations to talk about weapons of mass destruction, you know, basically uh, showcasing intelligence that wasn't correct. Right. And, you know, that's when I, I said, wait a minute, there's something, going, there's something going on here. This isn't right. And that led me down this whole path. Sooner or later, everybody kind of reaches that, whether it's looking at the TV and seeing police, you know, just beating, you know, children down for not wearing masks or, you know, new lockdowns or some crazy new law that gets passed or, you know, even, you know, something you find out, you send your kid off to public school, they come home someday using words uh, that, you know, make you absolutely horrified, wondering what are these people teaching my children yeah. in this school, you know, and, and, and it can terrify a lot of parents. So that, that's the sort of thing that makes people go, okay, there's something going on here. And sooner or later, everybody starts to realize that in the meantime, if you don't have the kind of agreement with your spouse that you're hoping for, the best thing to do is keep the discussion rational and focus on the things that you can at least agree on are the most important, you know, the children's safety, the education, the way that they're brought up, uh, you know, security in our neighborhood, all these sorts of things. And then think, well, you know, we're the thing I always talk about with a plan B is it's the stuff that you're, you're not worse off for having this. Right. You know, which is what I would say, like, you know, for, for something like, uh, for me, something like a second passport, a lot of people qualify for a second passport. They don't even realize it. Mm. They, they don't realize that like, Oh, my grandfather, my, is from, from Poland, you know, my, you know, so in all these sorts of things, you know, ancestral passports and, uh, I mean, there's just passports. I mean, if you're Jewish, you can get, a, you can get Israeli citizenship. You, this is so, there's so many different options. Uh, and we, we cover a lot of these, a lot of, we, too many to go into right now, but there's so many options. And so if you look at that, um, you, you could literally spend a, a little bit of time very little money and go get one of these, for example, ancestral passports. If you qualify, there is no downside right. to doing that to say like, wow, now me, because a little bit of work that I did, me, my spouse, my kids, future generations that won't be born for decades will have this thing. will have this passport. Your grandchildren's grandchildren will have this passport because of the work that you did. There are very few things in this world that have that kind of longevity that you can provide to future generations, future descendants that literally won't be born for decades and you can still pass that down to them and that gives them an option if a hundred years from now you've got a great great grandkid that decides they want to go and move to a foreign country, like suddenly now they have this passport and that gives them options to live and work and travel and invest and open a business and all sorts of things in another country and that's the sort of thing that you have to look at your spouse and say, there's no downside there's literally no downside in doing that, you know, but if if for whatever reason, we might ever need to use it, and we have a lot of upside. So I would focus the discussion on, on those sorts of points, starting with the commonality of the things that you can agree are the most important. And if you can't agree on the things that are most important in your relationship, you know, that's a separate discussion for people <laughs> you might need to have. So the next discussion might be with a marriage counselor, but, uh, right. you know, you ideally you at least have buy-in on that. And then focus on the things you say, what are the things that we can do where there's just really no downside? 
you know, and focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you said earlier, it's all about setting your priorities. It's all about kind of thinking about, okay, let's maybe get outside of our comfort zone because that's where we really grow and then taking action and then right. just realizing that there's no downside with a plan B. When people right. talk about being tethered to their job, I always try to encourage them to set up a side hustle. And I use the example of this YouTube channel. I started it a little over a year and a half ago when I was just in Medellin, um, just kind of on a whim. And in 2020, going back to your earlier point, the channel grew by 205,000 subscribers just in, in 2020. And, and, and trust me, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I almost flunked out of high school. I've never taken a class in finance or investing or macro, just completely self-taught by listening to podcasts like yours and shifts and guys like Doug Casey and Rick Rule. So, uh, you know, and it's such a niche topic as well. I mean, who would have ever thought that there'd be all these people that want to watch videos on, on, on macro, like the repo market or quantitative easing, you know? So right. again, my point is if I can do it, anybody can do it on whatever you're an expert at, just get outside of your comfort zone. I want to take it back though, because you're comparing this uh, kind of what we're in right now to the time back in 15, 16, that lasted for 80 58. years, that, that's staggering. And then yeah. saying that, uh, you know, back during the Spanish flu, uh, people were, were thinking that it would go back to quote unquote normal. It, it might not. So uh, my first question would be, how did it end back in 15, 16, you know, that whole time frame? what was the end game there and how did it change? And then it, if you see this as kind of a similar setup to the late 19 uh, teens, do, do you see us going into kind of a 1920s mode or more of a 1930s mode? Uh, interesting, interesting set of questions. So, um, let's, let's, let's go with the more recent past. Um, if we think about world war one and the end of world war one, again, you, you've got so many, I mean, just talk about a devastating event, especially for Europe. I mean, it completely right. obliterated. Um, but even in the United States, uh, where you have so much of the manufacturing capacity, of the United States now going to the, to the war effort just a massive economic toll, you know, what, what they had to do with taxes, what they had to do with the, you know, the debt and the deficit as a result of that. And people were just sick of it. And then on top of that, now 50 million people worldwide, you know, perish from the Spanish flu. So many people get it. And they, you know, they had the same thing. They were wearing masks and, you know, there's a lot of paranoia and all these things as a, as a result of that. So then all of a sudden, what do they do? They brought in the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve printed an enormous amount of money right? Which is exactly what they're doing now. They printed an enormous amount of money uh, and they financed this massive asset boom uh, that, you know, eventually collapsed and, you know, caused the, you know, the worst depression, you know, really that uh, uh, certainly the worst depression in modern history in the West in the United States, if you don't count the hyperinflationary episodes and, you know, and so forth, but for, you know, Western civilized advanced nations, uh, this is a terrible, terrible time. Right. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is though, Meanwhile, uh, you know, you had, I mean, Germany was bankrupt and, you know, you had the rise of, you know, the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler during all that. So, you know, essentially the the fallout of World War One is essentially what caused World War Two and all the things that result of that, the atomic bomb. And, and, and uh, I mean, it, and I just I mean, to take it to a, a further step, Bretton Woods, the dollar. Right, are exactly. I, I, yeah, no, I, I was actually going to get to that. It's like the the the. Really, the pronouncement of the United States is, you know, being the you know, the head of the global banking order at that point, creating Bretton Woods and the system, uh, you know, where everything was based on the dollar and even to the state, even though we got off Bretton Woods formally and, and everything is, is uh, you know, fiat and free floating now, uh, you know, the United States is still, in theory, the top dog, although that's, you know, that's going to change here. It's already changing, um, you know, right, right in front of our very eyes. I think in the case of the Dutch Revolt, um, you know, which really goes back to the you know, to the mid 1500s, 1560s, really all the way to to the mid, uh, you know, 16, uh, mid to late 1640s. You know, it was interesting because it it started off, um, uh, you know, really as kind of a revolt between Protestants and Catholics, and Protestants felt that they were very poorly treated in the United Provinces, which today would be the, the Netherlands, and and uh, this was all sort of part of the Holy Roman Empire, and um, and they felt that they were very poorly treated, and and 
uh, you know, you had the Inquisition and so forth. And there are some there are some very serious episodes of Protestants being incredibly badly treated publicly, and everybody could see it. And it was shocking. After a certain point, a lot of people said, "Enough is enough." You know, these people are getting tortured, they're getting killed. You know, too many Protestants are getting killed. It's unjust. It's not fair. And then next thing you know, there was just violent revolution all over the place. And people were going down and, and ripping down all these Catholic statues and breaking into into uh, uh, cathedrals and, and, and pillaging and, and setting fire to everything. And they'd say, oh, then they were doing it to private businesses and residential properties. And their people had nothing to do with any of this. Right. And suddenly their house is on fire. And, and, and they're like, what is going on? And uh, the lady who was uh, regent for uh, the United Provinces, uh, for I think it was probably Charles V at the time, and she wrote a letter and she said, anything, everything is now accepted in the United Provinces except the Catholic religion. Um, so the idea is that you had to be, you know, you had to be tolerant of everyone and everything, whatever anybody wanted to be, whatever they wanted to do, you had to accept that and, and sort of bow down to, you know, however, you know, they sort of choose to identify, um, unless you were Catholic, in which case, you know, then you were evil scum and then people started running around and, you know, gangs of people beating up Catholics and things like and so forth. So it's just, Again, that like sounds, that sounds exactly like I we've mean, I seen this before. It sounds like you know Trump supporters, Republican libertarians. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds exactly like what's going on now. We've seen this before. There are people that got chased out of town. People that were banished because of their, you know, religious because of their their Catholic faith, etc. I mean, it, so we've been here before. And and again, even that, that's not the first time that's happened either. So no, I mean, right. we, we we can go back. Uh, I mean, literally thousands of years um, and see different historical examples of this. So this is not, we've been here before. And the point that the larger story here is that these conflicts, you know, these culture wars, these things like they left, how do you feel about it if you're on one side or the other? I think the important thing is to sort of at least recognize that these things last a very long time and they're uncomfortable for everybody. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things at the same time, though, that create opportunity. There are always these uh, you know, kind of giant leaps forward because a lot of times these things are they're in a way kind of accelerators. COVID was an accelerator. Um, you know, it's the old, you know, Nietzsche approach, you know, that which is about to fall deserves to be pushed <laughs> in a way. So you look at some of these brick and mortar companies, uh, you know, that, that were already struggling and, you know, couldn't really survive and, and you know, to go, what, you know, the, they, they, I mean, there was. They had probably ten years at best, anyways, and now all of a sudden, right. a lot of these guys started declaring bankruptcy because it was inevitable. It was going to happen. It just sort of accelerated ten years of, you know, the economic and you know, business and market trends into about six months, and all these things happened. It's the same thing happened with real estate. There are a lot of people, you know, over a period of time, they're going to realize why should I pay this super expensive, you know, price so I can, you know, walk around with used hypodermic needles and step over feces and so forth, walking around the streets of San Francisco and, and pay sky high taxes and now wealth taxes. All these. Why should I do that? And over, you know, the next 10 years, it would have been more and more people realized that probably wasn't a smart thing to do. You know, things really accelerated uh, in 2020. And so it kind of in a way, uh, you know, is the catalyst. It's like in nature, if you look at if you look at uh, sort of genetic science, right, most of the time, that's a pretty staid thing. You've got you know, you've got DNA that sort of comes together, and you know, and, you, and it, it creates, you know, new DNA cells split, and they come. But every now and again, nature throws in a mutation, right? Mm -hmm. And this is sort of the sort of thing of, of, of the reason why we have evolved the way that we have is because at some point along the way, you know, when we were all, you know, whatever amoeba, you know, and, and there was a cells that split, there was a little mutation. And the reason that we have brains, we have hands and fingers and thumbs and so forth, because along the way, as you know, these traits and characteristics in our DNA was passed down, nature kind of threw in a little mutation, right? And and those mutations through sort of these Darwinian principles and survival of the fittest, the ones, these mutations that worked out really well, the ones that survived and passed down to future generations. And in a way, that's kind of what this is. It's like these trends over long periods of time were, you know, in many respects, like how nature, you know, cells split and DNA comes together and so forth. But something like COVID, you know, where basically everything we saw in 2020 was like this weird anomalous mutation that got thrown in there. And we just sort of incorporated all of that into our collective DNA. Uh, and now we make the best of it, right? And, and, it's, and it's from that that 
that's the sort of stuff we had to wait. You know, you've got to sort of reinvent yourself. You've got to reinvent your business. You've got to, you know, kind of engage in different ways and all this stuff. And so that just sort of becomes a little bit part of who we are because it doesn't go back to normal. It never goes back to normal. Nothing ever really goes back to normal. You can go back thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, Rome never went back to normal. The Byzantine Empire never went back to normal. Mongolian Empire never went back to normal. Nothing ever goes back to normal. And that's okay. You yeah, know, because you know, I don't worry about individuals yeah. using this as an opportunity in the free market. Just you know, it's it's Schumpeter's creative destruction. But where I get concerned is governments using yeah. it as an opportunity to expand their power. And I see what's going on now with just com just completely ignoring any type of constraint on the government. Uh, it takes me back to the Patriot Act, and I know you've 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 studied this and you've written so extensively on FATCA as an example. And my big concern when this came out, I started talking about I call it the Cervasis sickness to kind of be YouTube friendly, but I started talking about this, and it, it, this is something we need to look at way back in January of 2020. But it, and I didn't know how bad it was going to be, but I, I, I the one thing that I said is okay, let's just make sure the governments give us all the information and let us make the decision as to what how we want to approach it, because if we allow the government power they're never going to give it back. So if, if what we saw as a, if FATCA and the Patriot Act was a result of 9-11, what do you think is going to be the result of 2020 and this last crisis that we've dealt with as far as future size and intervention and micromanagement with big government? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, they, they, they don't ever seize power with the intention of giving it back. That never happens. Right. Um, the, uh, there I go using absolute. So this is where I have to check my own logic and go, hmm, have they given it back before? Actually, they have. If I think about it, you know, uh, if you go back really thousands of years, and I actually sort of like this concept in, in ancient Greece, and, uh, you know, to a degree in, 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 the, in the Roman, not even the Roman Republic, but what predates Roman, the Roman Republic is, you know, when they still had the kingdoms and so forth. In these very early days, whenever there would be a crisis, a really serious crisis in the, in the actual technical Greek sense of the word, um, they would often appoint a dictator. And the dictator would take full and totalitarian control over the, the city-state uh, until the crisis passed, and then would relinquish it. Uh, and so there was actually historical examples I can, I can actually prove my wrong when I say they never give it back, because sometimes they do. And actually what they used to do, and I actually like this tradition, is they would put, a lot of times they would put these people on trial and to, to actually judge all the things that they did and didn't do. And if they found there's any malfeasance or impropriety, then the person could be put to death. Wow. So, yeah, so corrupt, essentially the death penalty was the punishment for corruption, malfeasance, uh, impropriety, and even ineptitude. Uh, if you, you were have given politicians left, Simon. Right, exactly. Nobody would be left. I mean, if, if you were put in, in a way that if you're given that level of responsibility, then, then there should be kind of a commensurate, uh, you know, level of punishment if you screw it up. But um, I think, you know, with respect to you saying, I, so many people I think can be really surprised. At, and, and again, going back to this gentleman that I spoke to in Australia, it's a great book. Um, he, he wrote a book about it. It's called The uh, Great Hysteria in the Broken State. Uh, his name is Sanjeev, and Sanjeev um, wrote about his experiences and the things that he saw. In, in he's an immigrant, he came to Australia because he thought it was the land of opportunity, wow. and now all of a sudden he's seeing the worst, most totalitarian lockdowns, police being used as violent brown shirt enforcers. Uh, they put, you know, they start off and they they close the national border, then they close the state borders within Australia, so. Uh, we acquired a company in Australia, for example, in the in the northern, uh, 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 far north of New South Wales, near the border of Queensland, for example. You know, you, you just can't get back. They have employees on both sides of the border. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's just, it's a total mess. Then, within Victoria, then not only did they shrink it to the state border, then they started shrinking it around the city of Melbourne. And they created this iron wall uh, around Melbourne. And then they started shrinking it even further into neighborhoods. You can't go more than... You know, however many, you know, feet or whatever from your home. I mean, it's completely insane, right? And, and so 
that's you know he calls it you know he calls it public health terrorism uh you know which is a strong word you know but he he sort of backs it up and he justifies it by saying uh you know when you think about sort of what the idea of terrorism is is sort of making people afraid in order to exact some agenda you know he makes a very strong argument that that's really what this is because they're not really focused on 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 the data they're focused on the data they want you to see not the data they don't want you to see uh you know and the idea is they you know they want you afraid to cower in fear in your home to be terrified uh, and, 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 you know, and, and they end up taking an enormous amount of control. And I think the future of that, in the same way that we saw after 9-11, you know, Homeland Security became the big deal. Homeland Security became, they had all the authority, they could do anything they wanted to. And we started seeing all the civil assets mature and all those trends where the government just come in and take your assets. You haven't done anything wrong. They even tell you, no, you haven't done anything wrong, but we're still going to take all of your assets uh, because you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The, the, the fact that you have no more banking privacy, the fact that it's impossible to, to, to do even just basic, simple, innocuous things anymore without mountains of paperwork that your banks have to treat you like criminal suspects now because of these laws that they passed. And all this had to do kind of went back to Homeland Security and they were the big shots. Now it's going to be the public health officials. Those are going to be the guys that have their, you know, their powerful fiefdoms. These guys are going to be, you know, feudal warlords. That, that have all this power, they get to decide all this, I mean, you know, you know, right, it reminded me of, it's just this weird kind of like pre noctas kind of stuff where they started telling young people like how you should have sex, wear a mask, don't face each other, you know, do it, do it in this position and all this stuff that you just have to look at this and say, are these people serious? You know, there's no end to the amount of power and influence they want to have over every part of our lives, including the most intimate acts that human beings can engage in. Right. And they're trying to, they're literally trying to insert themselves. They're trying to insert themselves into the most, the most intimate acts. Yeah, maybe insert is the right word. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I heard myself say literally insert. I go, well, then maybe they're not literally inserting themselves into that. So, <laughs> unless you're into that sort of thing, I guess. So, uh, you know, but I, I, I you know, I, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's revolting. It's degrading. It's disgusting. But they are really like feudal warlords now. Because in, in, in the thing that's different uh, is that before, with the, I think post 9/11 world. It was the federal government that had all the power. Now it's local. I mean, the federal, yeah, sure, the federal is going to have all the power, but now it's state officials, county officials, local officials. And this is a thing that I would, I always try to remind people of is when we think about politics, we love to sort of complain the most about national politics. And that's the one that really gets all the headlines. That's what we all talk about the most because it's a thing that everybody sort of has in common. Right. State politics matters a lot more because when you think about it, state government is going to raise your taxes a whole lot more, a whole lot faster than the national government is going to do. Um, all the things that they change in terms of business regulations, all that stuff, the state government is going to do it much, much faster. The biggest one, though, is the county, uh, the, the, the local officials, the municipal and the county officials, because those guys, I mean, they're going to do the same thing. They could jack up your property rates tomorrow if they want to change your property tax, done. Um, but they control everything. They've got the public health, uh, the county health officials who get to have, you know, they get to have their own little fight and say, in this county, you can't do this. You have to do this, whatever. And they're, you know, and their word is law instantly. Right. They get to dictate what goes on in the public schools, what your children are taught, and they control the police. So if you have a, you know, Christmas get together and mom and dad come over, you know, they can send the police over your house. You get like Eric Garcetti. He says, oh, we're going to cut the power. We're going to cut the power of these heretics are out there, you know, having part, how dare they go and see their family. Right. And, and, and so they have the power to do all these things that even the federal government can't do, you know, or isn't willing to do, or, you know, the, the apparatus is too bureaucratic, but the local guys, they are all over that. They took the cops over, they cut the power, they teach your kids all these things in school. And so it's the local that actually matters most right. by far. And so people think like, oh, the country, whatever. It's like, it, it, yeah, fine. Think about that. But you and I tell we I was I was telling our total access members this uh, when we had our event in Mexico this past weekend is that everybody, 
has to make a very deliberate decision where you've got to look at where you live locally. Forget about the country. And this is everybody. Well, I don't care if you're in France or you're in Australia or you're in South Africa or in Canada or the United States. It doesn't matter. You've got to look at locally where you live and figure out who really has the power. And in a lot of places in the United States and, you know, parts of Canada as well, it's the local that matters most. Right. And you got to look at where you are locally and say, do I want, you know, do I want these people in charge of my kid? Do I want these people in charge of my safety? Do I want to listen to these public health officials because they have so much power now? And by the way, this is power that they were never awarded. Nobody ever appointed a public health official and said, I want that person to be able to dictate every aspect of my personal life. I want them to tell me when I can go out of my house, whether or not I can go to work, whether or not I'm allowed to earn a living for my family, how I should have sex with my wife or my friend. You know, yeah, I want this person to tell me all that information. Nobody was ever awarded that authority, yet they have taken it for themselves. And we just kind of go, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. Right. Well, there are plenty of things you can do about it. But the most important thing is to start looking and go, do I really want to, do I want to outsource all the decision making in my life to that person? Yeah. Because the answer is no, then you need to make a change in your life. You need to make a very deliberate decision about this. But I see, I think that's the, the, the good news. It kind of goes back what we were talking uh, about before where someone's you know they want to let's say they want to stay domestically but they still want to take yeah. some sort of action i mean that's action that people can actually take everyone right. watching this right now can look around at your local officials the local sheriff and and say okay how much are they going to enforce right. how much do they value right liberty? that's right and and if the answer is you know if the answer is not very much you know the sheriff is just you know some you know it's just some stooge is going to follow the public health official says, go and round those guys up because, you know, and the sheriff's going to go, okay, you know, that maybe that's not the place you want to live. If your if your school system where your kids go to school is filled with a bunch of blatant Marxists, you know, uh, who, 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 you know, who fill your kid's head with a, with a curriculum of shame, guilt, victimhood, and Marxism, and you don't want your kids going to that kind of institution anymore, then Again, this is a deliberate decision. You've got to you've got to look at your life and say, what do I stand for? Do I stand for anything? What's important to me? Because if the answer is, well, I don't know, you know, then you know, I don't know why you're watching this. Yeah. If, if, if you're honestly like, if if you're the kind of person that doesn't really have any principles, you're not really willing to stand for anything, you're not willing to take a stand, you know, for yourself, because you might find, hell, I might move one county over to a totally different world. All right. You know. Or a couple of counties over, maybe it's a totally different world, or I move across the state line, it's a totally different world. There are still places, there are always varying degrees of this thing, but there's, gonna, there's always going to be places that are better. There's going to be places that are more suitable to your circumstances. But again, I think, you know, you've got to start with wondering, like, what do I really stand for as a human being? And this is, if you're not willing to do that now, at least think through, what do I really stand for? I mean, you've got to stand for something, uh, you know, at this point. And, and, and I think a lot of people are going to feel really a lot of passion for the things that they stand for. And, and if you do and you feel that way, you do have options. There are options. And, and you, there are a lot of options you can take. And, and it's just a, a really about deliberate thinking and deliberate decision making. I remember I saw a T-shirt a buddy of mine had in college that said, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And yeah, it's a great, that's a great line. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, man, I know we're running short on time. I, I didn't even get a chance to go into the macroeconomic stuff that I really want to touch on. We'll, we'll have to <laughs> yeah, do that, that too. Uh, conversation. Sure. Yeah, one thing I've been thinking through, I'd love to get your take on <clears throat> is I, I went back in a, a video I did the other day to 2003 and I noticed that we had, my memory serves me right, about 18 of these, we'll just call them a uh, kind of health scares, right? We had swine right. flu, we had uh, birds. Right, they the bird flu and MERS and, exactly. you know, there's even a couple of Ebola, uh, you know, outbreaks here and there. Yeah, so what I was thinking is for the future, I mean, have we set a precedent for the, the maybe the local governments or the federal governments? Absolutely. The next time, because we had one of these things like every two years, roughly. And so let's just assume that we, well, let's assume we do go back to quote unquote normal. And, uh, but what happens in two years when we have the next scare and we've kind of got this, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome from what we just dealt with, with the local officials, are they going to 
Do you think they'll immediately go take these draconian measures, try kind of like shoot first and ask questions later when before Absolutely. it would be like, okay, Absolutely. calm down guys. Let's just, let's see what's going on here. Then let's collect the data and then we'll make a decision. It's probably nothing. Like that's the attitude we have before. Do you think in the future it'll be the complete opposite? We'll see more of these draconian measures taken for different- all, all this stuff. I mean, you know, the idea of health passports, you know, you're, you're gonna have to carry around on your phone all this stuff and all the contact tracing and the data and the masks, the, you know, I mean, uh, and you know, and, and you're going to see this stuff with the airlines, with a, uh, you know, a lot of travel companies, stuff like that, really kind of pushing these, these things. There's going to be companies that honestly, there's going to be companies that are very successful pushing these sorts of technologies, you know, around on everybody that we're all, you know, wandering around the stuff and, and, you know, with our, with our health records and our, you know, measurements of, of you know, you know, it, it, it's it's like, you know, the, the old legal principle that's supposed to exist that you're presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. Right. So it, to me, it's like, I, I wish we sort of held that standard with, when it comes to health, you know, in a way, but, it, but you're presumed to be diseased. Every human being now, it's like, you know, you're just a disease factor. You're an evil, walking, breathing disease and all these words that have, these terms that have entered our lexicon now. Like the World Health Organization uses one that I love called respiratory etiquette. Make sure you're practicing good respiratory etiquette. Don't breathe on anybody because you're diseased. You're a diseased person and you need to have respiratory etiquette. Wow. And this stuff isn't going away, right? There, 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 there's not, you know, it's not like the World Health Organization, which now is the most relevant international, you know, NGO agency ever nobody nobody ever cared about the world health organization five years ago the who literally the who right? Right. nobody cared about these guys right and now all of a sudden they're the big shot they're not going to let that go in the same way as the department of homeland security never said you know what we don't really need all this power so all these things they're doing they're only going to escalate this stuff and, and, and you can actually just if you want to see you just have to look at the all the the budget proposals, the things they want to do, how much money they want to put into contact tracing. Well, contact tracing is just a nice way of saying surveillance. Right. Where we, we get to walk, you know, we get to, we get to monitor if we're going. And of course, the tech companies are falling all over themselves for this. So Google's already got all this, you know, contact tracing stuff. And, you know, you walk around with your phone, you got your little, you know, geolocation on and, you know, Google's tracking everywhere you go and all your contacts and where they're going. And now it's all this mass surveillance. Department, the, the health department's going to go and get all this data from these guys. I mean, that stuff is not going away. It's just not going away. And even if they come back and they say, oh, we've managed to convince all these people to get the vaccine, and now we think that you know the numbers are going down. I mean, it's, it's it, honestly, it's, they're just never going to go back. Right? So never again, most likely. <laughs> Let's say put it this way. We have not seen the... <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen a case. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of cases with public health departments with a pandemic this size where they just voluntarily relinquish all this stuff. What's interesting, and I think the best example of this is actually Hong Kong, where, you know, in, in Asia in general, where they've lived with a lot of these things, you know, they, they sort of were the epicenter of, you know, of H1N1, you know, all the, all the bird flus and all those sorts of things that they've been through. A lot of those things you're talking about that were epidemics, and not full-blown pandemics, but epidemics, um, you know, all those years ago and, and have recurred. And so they're sort of accustomed to that. And this is why, you know, you see it's, it's very common if you go to HKIA and you wander around and you see a lot of people wearing face masks. You know, you, you see that two, three years ago before because it was just sort of this cultural thing for them. Uh, I remember the first time I ever went to a hotel in Hong Kong. And the first thing the lady did was she hopped across the counter and she stuck one of those temperature guns in my forehead mm. and took my temperature. I didn't know what was going on, you know, and it was it was just because that just got incorporated into their procedures to make sure that the person coming in didn't have a fever and he wasn't sick. Um, so uh, again, these sorts of things, like I said, it's like, it sort of becomes part of your DNA. And once that bizarre genetic mutation essentially becomes part of our cultural DNA, you, you can't really get rid of it. Uh, and so as a lot of these things I think are going to be here going to be with us for a very long time and the you know, same with the governments i don't think the governments are really going to relinquish control and uh, you know that's why i think it's really up to everybody individually to think through very deliberately about the kind of life that they want to live the kind of life they want for their children how they want their family to be brought up 
the, you know, the, the resources they have, the resources they want to have, the skills that they have, the things that they could be, you know, how they could be building skills and educating themselves and really working that through methodically like a plan. They, I might be stuck here now, but if I do these things and build these skills and acquire these resources, then I'm going to be able to leave. And once I do that, I'm going to want to go to these top three places. And in the meantime, I'm going to make sure my kids are doing these things and all. You know, that's what a plan is. You know, it's not some pie in the sky idea. It's detailed action, you know, related to your personal circumstances. Everybody has the ability to do that. And it's premeditated. So you take the emotion out Absolutely. of the equation. Absolutely. Yeah, and on that note, uh, I don't think there's any better resource out there for setting up these plans than your website. So, and I know we're right at the tail end here. <laughs> Go ahead and tell my viewers how to find out about what you do, your website. I don't know if you're doing any uh, podcast episodes or kind of what the future game plan is, but where they can find out. Man, more. I haven't done a podcast in, uh, well, it's been such a long time. I just, I'm just so busy. I mean, uh, you know, the Sovereign Man, it's, I've got an amazing team, I've got an amazing team. Um, you know, the, they, they, they really run the business. Um, you know, I write, the, you know, the notes articles in the morning, uh, but I, I'm, I'm just so busy. I, don't, I have a lot of other businesses and interests that I look after. So I, I don't do the podcast anymore. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, sometimes I think I'd like to get back into it, but I just have so many demands on my time. But uh, well, anyways, yeah, I mean, people want to learn more. We've got a ton of free resources on our website. Um, you know, we, we really just bend over backwards to try and help people out. Um, and the site is just sovereignman.com. Yeah. And at the very least, you guys have to go there and uh, and give your email address, get on his uh, his email list because, uh, I mean, great emails. But then if I'm not mistaken, every Friday or so, you, you send out an email of what's happened this past week that's just absolutely ridiculous. And yeah. a lot of those, yeah. they're very informative, but they're very entertaining. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so most of them are incredibly entertaining. Yeah, so that's a that's a Friday treat that we do, and then you know, through the week we talk about different things. So um, I've been on a I've been on a little bit of a tech company kick, um, which is again one of those simple things. A lot of people look at and see this massive power of the tech companies deplatforming and canceling people, and I would say they're only powerful because we give them power over us. But that's easily we can take that away from them yeah, by right. doing all these things. Like you don't have to use Gmail, you don't have to use. Google, you don't have to use any of these things. You can actually you know, pull away from that. So just a, a small example that you actually have a lot more power than they want you to believe that you have. Yeah, yeah. All right, Simon, I sincerely appreciate your time. It was awesome to finally get the chance to speak with you. And I cannot wait to do it again. Yeah, this was fun.